Good day, everyone. I'm Richard Fowler with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And I'd like to welcome you to the US DOE 2021 Summer Seminar Series. Today, we have a great one-hour discussion-based seminar plan that will address codes around the globe, a cross-national comparison of building energy codes. Looking ahead, this series will cover other timely topics, such as the evolution of commercial building design and construction, equity zoning and land use, and more. This series is hosted every other Thursday, so we hope you will join us in the future. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator to get the conversation started. We are happy to have Jack Marinick with us from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. He's a member of the Strategy Energy Analysis Center in Washington, DC, that supports the US Department of Energy Building Technologies Office. Welcome, Jack. Take it away. Thanks, Richard. Um, you know, really excited for the uh, session here today. Um, part of my remit uh, in the Strategic Energy Analysis Center is uh, supporting the Building Technologies Office with international engagements. And um, it's a really exciting area to be engaging on um, building energy codes. And uh, we've got two great uh, speakers here today to, to kind of unpack that issue. Um, first up is the director of the Building Technologies Office, David Nemzo. Um, and not only is he the, the director of BTO, um, but he also represents the United States um, to the International Energy Agency's Energy and Buildings and Communities Technology Collaboration Program. It's really just a fancy way of saying um, a research organization that focuses on energy efficiency in buildings and communities. Um, and uh, he also co-chairs the Building Energy Codes Working Group within that um, uh, technology collaboration program. So um, let me turn it over to David to give us some opening remarks here. Uh, great, great, thanks, Jack. Uh, can you hear me okay, Jack? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, well, you know, I want to say it's good to see everybody, but I can only see Jack here, and I saw Richard a moment ago. But I know uh, we have a lot of participants in today's uh, uh, seminar, and as you heard from Richard, this is part of a series that we're doing. I hope you also are able to participate in uh, when we have the uh, our annual CODES conference in July of this year. Uh, unfortunately, it was virtual, but we had a very good um, uh, uh, two-day session, including uh, the U.S. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm. So today we're focusing on, uh, uh, as you know, on international codes. We invited uh, our colleagues to not just uh, from the U.S. but from around the world who uh, are part of our orbit. Uh, it, you know, Meredith Evans uh, will be speaking today, and um, you know. Building codes have been around for a long time. Building energy codes have been around for a long time, in particular. But there's been a a, a, a a real resurgence of them in a lot of jurisdictions, including in the U.S. Certainly, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But uh, in the European Union and in other countries, there's uh, just greater and greater recognition that we are, uh, that any jurisdiction, national or subnational jurisdiction, that wants to deal seriously with climate change needs to deal with building codes, and that's new construction that's existing. So we're going to talk about that. But first, let me just give you a brief overview and then turn it over to uh, Meredith Evans from PNNL. So again, you can see uh, this slide. So this, I hope you're good at acronyms. The International Energy Agency has a set of the Energy and Building Buildings and Communities Program, which has a Building Energy Codes Working Group. And our Building Energy Codes Working Group uh, is who's uh, organized this session today and uh, uh, that Meredith and Jack uh, and I participate in. I don't have to read every word here. You can see our objectives. We were established informally in 2018 in a meeting in Stockholm. And the, and the decision was taken that there are a lot of the different countries, especially in the IEA member countries, uh, as well as many others that were going through the same kinds of issues about building codes. Uh, how do you strengthen them? How do you factor in carbon, not just energy? How do we think about existing buildings? How do we think about new technologies, such as, not new technologies, but new to building code technologies, such as photovoltaics or EV charging or grid interactivity and connectedness? So different countries were dealing with those issues and we created the building energy code working group so that we could learn from each other and um 
Uh, and we've been going since then uh, with uh, a lot of the work of uh, Meredith Evans and Allison Delgado um, of PNNL. And you can see some of the activities there. Uh, we have exchanges with newsletters. We do uh, uh, webinars. The last one we did uh, was with Adam uh, Hinge, did a very interesting, important report on the role of building codes in existing buildings. Uh, looked at building performance standards, but some other policy tools. I've lost track of time. I want to say that was four or six weeks ago. And uh, we have a few coming up on um, uh, virtual techniques for building codes uh, and, and some others. And um, we're hoping, we haven't quite finalized it because uh, now the Delta variant, we're hoping to have our biennial uh, building code symposium uh, in November, around the same time as the EBC's uh, winter meeting, which is scheduled for Tokyo, but uh, uh, we'll, I may well be virtual. So those are some of the activities, uh, information exchange, research, analysis, information sharing. You see at the bottom there, these are the member countries of the uh, Building Energy Codes Working Group. And, um, uh, and we always welcome more, especially those that are active in the IEA, because this is an IEA function. Next slide, please. If you would like to work with us and participate, there are a lot of ways to do it. I'll do this in backwards order, actually. The easiest is go to our website. You see it there, and, and as Richard said, these slides will be available. You can just Google and, and re recapture that URL, and you can see what we're up to. Allison Delgado uh, at PNNL. Uh, contact her for uh, all sorts of things, including getting on the uh, distribution list. And then if you want to be more engaged, uh, because of the formality of it, you, we need you to go through your national representative. Um, and you can get that list from that, that uh, URL up there. So if you're from, it doesn't matter if you work for the government. If you're from Austria, it doesn't matter if you work for the Austrian government or from Turkey or Brazil, you need to please ask your uh, rep uh, many of you are Americans, so I, I'm the rep, and, and you can email me uh, at davidnemso at ee.doe.gov. And uh, the committee is also co-chaired by Michael Dunn of uh, New Zealand, and uh, uh, he's been very active. Uh, and I will say this, scheduling meetings uh, among uh, a Kiwi, uh, Americans, and Europeans, uh, and, and East Asians is not the uh, least of our troubles. So I just want to say we're a very active group, and then the EBC itself has a secretariat there. And I, 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 I would go on the website. I would go on the IEA EBC website. Even if you're a codes person, there's a lot there that is either directly about codes or indirectly about emerging technologies, about practices, about field validation and verification, about valuation. There's just a lot of interesting uh, information. So that's who we are. Let me talk a little, if you could click for me, uh, about what's going on in the U.S. If you're at the uh, July conference or you've been active in the U.S., this will be old news to you. So I will talk quickly. I'll revert to my native New York status. I'll talk quickly, and I'll let you look at these slides later. They're very similar to the slides I shared in July. So, you know, we, we all know the role of codes. The, in the U.S., the Department of Energy uh, doesn't promulgate building codes with the important exceptions of federal buildings and manufactured housing. But by and large, we don't promulgate codes. What do we do? We help develop the model codes, uh, and we do that with PNNL and others, and that's through, uh, of course, the International uh, uh, Codes Council and through ASHRAE, so help develop and strengthen those model codes. Then we work with state and local governments to support code adoption and implementation. We often call that technical assistance. These are state and local decisions, uh, but we want to help them make informed decisions, and we want to encourage them. We're not shy about that. If you saw Secretary, uh, Energy Secretary Granholm at the July conference, she wasn't shy about it. She's a former governor. She wants to push the states into adopting codes that will improve the affordability of, of, of homes and buildings in their jurisdictions and uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas and other emissions and lower energy costs. So we work with states and local government, increasingly local governments do that. And then we're working on these innovative solutions for the future that I uh, referenced early. How do you build into codes? How do you make it an option, uh, uh, option at the national level and then mandatory at the state or local level, uh, zero energy codes, again, EV charging, et cetera. You'll see more. Next slide, please. 
And look, this is just to say, have this is a Rorschach test, right? So if you look at this in the last 40 years, almost 50 years now, we've greatly increased the efficiency of the model codes. This is in these little updating, but green is uh, uh, residential, yellow is non-res. But you see where I'm going. I don't want to talk about the past. I want to talk about that next, where we're going. Keep clicking for me, please. So let's focus in on that part. We'd like to get to zero. There's no year there. We don't, we're not pushing for a particular outcome, but it would be, uh, I think it's important and achievable to get to 2030. I'm sure to get to zero net codes or zero a variant on that by 2030. Uh, there will be great savings next. And that's, uh, so that's the uh, goal we're working on. Again, I won't read this. These are some of those emerging themes I talked about. And you'll notice here, like I pick any of these, electrification. Some codes, some jurisdictions will have codes that promote electrification. That's up to them. Others will stay silent on the issue. That's up to them. But some will go somewhere in between called electrification ready, just like others are doing PV ready or um, zero net energy ready. What does that mean? It means, right, adopting many of the provisions like uh, the capability for wire without and harnesses that actually having the PVs from the EV charger. So there are a lot of uh, USDA we will help. Uh, different jurisdictions with that and, and again we'll learn from uh, other uh, countries um, you can see that next please you might want, you can read these later at your leisure okay uh, and I'll be done in just a second Richard um, and then uh, as you heard I might have heard Secretary Granholm say uh, DOE will provide a major new technical assistance support for state and local governments um, uh, it won't just be more of the same. It will be both more and better and very significant. A little bit of stay tuned on that. Um, so that's what I wanted to say. I believe that's my last slide. And uh, let me turn it back to uh, uh, let me turn it back to. Oh, and sorry, we released uh, 177 new technical reports. Many of those are state based. I'm losing my uh, bandwidth. Back to you, Jack. Great, thanks, David. Um, and hopefully we can get that uh, technical issue sorted out for the, the discussion um, in the second half. Um, but uh, while we sort that out, uh, we have Meredith Evans, um, who is a, a researcher at uh, PNNL's Joint Global um, Climate Change Research Institute. Um, based here in Maryland. Um, and Meredith has extensive experience with energy policy and finance, uh, particularly in the international realm. So, um, you know, everyone, you're in for a treat. Uh, Meredith, take it away. Thank you, Jack, and thank you, David. Um, so, as I really appreciate the um, description that David gave of both the uh, how the IEA and countries collaborating with it are um, working together on building energy codes through uh, this working group, but also how that dovetails with some of the work happening in the U.S. Um, I, in today's presentation, if you could forward to the next slide, um, I'll provide a little bit of background and context, and then I'll walk through just a few of the areas that we have um, worked on in a collaborative fashion through this working group. Uh, in particular, net zero energy and codes, uh, compliance, best practices, codes for existing buildings, the paper that David had previously referred to, as well as some of the other emerging areas of flavor for some of the webinars and whatnot that we do. And close with a few takeaways. Next slide. And go forward one more. So, you know, obviously codes are, are extremely important in our quest to reduce energy use and to decarbonize. Um, more and more countries as a result are adopting building energy codes with increasing coverage and stringency and with increasing um, implementation uh, elements to ensure that the codes achieve the promise of reduced energy use. Um, you know, when you look at codes in uh, and their impact on buildings, they're one of the most cost-effective policies for energy savings and greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, the energy efficiency measures are implemented through um, during initial construction and provide benefits across the entire lifespan of a building. So they, um, they can have a, a large impact once you cumulatively uh, are able to cover a substantial number of buildings. 
um, which is the whole goal of codes, since they are supposed to be mandatory and covering a large share of the stock. Next slide. Um, and I'll actually skip this one because I think David did a great job of covering the working group. Um, so the next slide, yep. And in terms of some of the emerging areas within the building energy code space, uh, we've done a deep dive into several areas. Uh, the path to net zero energy is one that we've had a uh, webinar um, on and we've touched on in many of our um, uh, reports as well. So many jurisdictions are making commitments to net or nearly zero energy buildings in their codes. Um, for example, in the EU, all member states or countries must have codes that mandate nearly zero energy buildings by this year, by 2021. Um, California, as many of you know, has an energy code that requires that all new residential buildings must be net zero starting in 2020 and commercial buildings by 2030. Australia has set a trajectory towards zero energy and zero carbon ready buildings. And Canada is introducing a similar framework. We've also heard in uh, some of our webinars from China where they're working on a net zero energy code um, and, and so on. Every uh, time we get together, I feel like there's another country that has begun work in this space. Um, uh, and in addition, there is a net zero carbon buildings for all initiative underneath the framework of the UN Secretary General, where several organizations, including um, World Resources Institute and others, came together um, and multiple countries made announcements on commitments for net zero carbon buildings, um, Kenya, Turkey, UAE, and the UK. And it's an interesting mix because it's not only the most developed countries, but a, a range of countries showing that there really is broad interest in this topic and trying to figure out how we cost effectively reduce our emissions and save energy. Next slide. So as David had mentioned, you know, when you look and um, David showed a, a similar slide looking at both uh, ASHRAE and um, uh, residential buildings, over time in the US, the building energy codes have become increasingly stringent and then we see the same thing in other countries and that dovetails closely with the desire to move to net zero energy so for example in denmark um, buildings built to the 2020 version of the code will consume just 20 uh, kilowatt hours per square meter for heating hot water and cooling um, uh, today versus a new building uh, from 1982 that consumed uh, six times that much uh, the EU's Energy Performance and Buildings Directive has led multiple countries to adopt new building energy standards or revise these standards more frequently. Um, and it, there are also countries, uh, including Denmark, as well as parts of the US, that have stretch codes. Um, Singapore was one of the first to develop this kind of framework where they had a set code, um, a, a green building standard, that then it was clear over a couple of years' time. Uh, uh, typically it's five years, I believe, in Singapore. They were going to make it more stringent based on the next level of voluntary uh, code and so on and so forth, providing some clarity to the market. Canada has also been working on a similar kind of a program. To, over time, ratchet down um, the energy use, increase the savings, and provide the market with clear indicators of where things are going so that companies that are producing the materials that go into buildings have time to transition. Um, there's also a trend toward um, looking at the building as a, as a entity in, in its entirety, so whole building requirements, um, in addition to the prescriptive requirements of the past. Many European countries focus primarily on those um, whole building requirements. Uh, and um, so, for example, in Denmark, uh, in looking at that, that, that leads them to adopting technologies such as triple glazed windows, advanced lighting controls, and super efficient furnaces, among others. Um, next slide. Uh, so, looking at why net zero energy matters from a global perspective, we did some analysis uh, for that net zero carbon building uh, initiative, looking at 
um, what happens if you have a 1.5 degree world? 1.5 means uh, that that's basically the commitment that countries had in the Paris Agreement. They said that they would try very hard to ensure that global climate change did not result in a total increase in um, temperature of above 1.5 degrees, threshold at which you start to get very severe climate impacts. So if you look at what um, a 1.5 degree world with significant reductions in um, carbon use as well, or I'm sorry, carbon emissions and energy use looks like, you can see um, uh, without uh, detailed sectoral building policies, that's that gray line at the top. While if you adopt um, uh, robust building energy policies, including building energy codes, you bring down that energy use quite a bit. And building energy codes has the single largest impact just because it covers, it, by design, it covers so many buildings and, and so many aspects of those buildings. And what does that do? That actually increases GDP in many countries, um, India, uh, Turkey, uh, as well as developed countries like the US. It increases our GDP compared to what it would be otherwise because you're saving so much energy. Um, so you're able to achieve these really deep reductions and improve um, economic performance with an, uh, building energy policies codes first and foremost. Ne next slide. Um, so looking on at another topic that we are working on, we're uh, currently finalizing a report on compliance best practices across countries. So achieving the potential of codes, of course, requires not just drafting a code, but effective implementation systems. Um, effective compliance checking requires adequate resources, technical knowledge, capacity, and strong institutions. And the institutional setup for code compliance can vary quite a bit. I mean, even within the United States, but certainly um, globally, there, there are many different setups uh, that we can uh, learn from. Uh, you know, I think you've probably heard the expression several times that it's almost impossible to, to thoroughly check every single com um, component or provision in the building energy code in every single building. And so how do you do, how do you ramp up the institutional setup so that you maximize both your ability to check and, and ensure that you're getting um, robust uh, implementation as well as um, increasing the, the capacity and the human, um, uh, the hands on the issue to, to achieve better outcomes. So for example, some places use self-certification and versus, you know, say national, regional, or local officials that may go into buildings. Um, increasingly, there's use of private third parties. And it, when we look at that globally, what kind of mechanisms can exist for ensuring that such uh, third parties um, and private sector entities don't have a conflict of interest uh, compared to the developers who may be paying for them, for example, um, or who may be uh, engaging them. Uh, in general, national governments develop the code while implementation is done at the local level. So there's a great need for connections between those two levels of government to ensure that codes um, operate smoothly. Next slide. Diving into training and capacity building, there are many different models for trying to improve and, and many different um, tools as well. And this is just a flavor for some of the um, types of things happening at different places around the world, as well as the breadth of activity that's going on. And, and I should note that we did not attempt to list every single possible country in, in these examples, simply highlights from some of the more prominent examples among the EBC member countries. So training programs for local governments on requirements and compliance, uh, many countries have programs around that. Um, software and software training, is also an important aspect because it can ensure uh, that the codes are mainstreamed. It makes it easier to comply. Uh, code compliance resource kits as well. That's um, something that we've seen very frequently because it's quite uh, inexpensive for countries to develop and then disseminate, assuming that, of course, that those resources then get to the local level where they're most needed. Uh, training and certificate programs for building inspectors so that there's a common um, set of knowledge that building inspectors will have uh, to apply to buildings across a jurisdiction. And then, you know, building the bench from the bottom up. So looking at university programs, 
uh, that focus on um, building energy efficiency, whether it's specific degrees or courses, but um, building that into people even before they begin their professional careers or, or as they're coming back to graduate school to enhance their skills so that then they go out in the field and they have good knowledge of building energy efficiency to start with um, is also something many countries are um, interested in expanding upon. Next slide. And then um, code evaluation, which is uh, really important to understand how a code program is performing and to make improvements over time. So with code evaluation, what we mean here is not just checking for compliance in individual buildings, but doing some kind of statistical analysis to understand how a program overall is working. Um, evaluation methods vary significantly across jurisdictions. And, um, you know, to give a few examples, in Australia, they are doing statistical sampling of a significant number of buildings under construction within given states to assess compliance. Um, in China, they study the discrepancies between building design and construction, uh, often in pre-announced um, uh, sur surveys that they will do in given cities that they're selecting according to a standard methodology. Um, Japan does an annual inspection of selected buildings across the country by a national agency. So, um, and, and in some cases in, in Japan and also in China, any problems they find are fixed, which is great. At the same time, it can make it harder to understand what compliance rates um, may be to try to, um, at least from the outside, understand how to improve um, processes. And in the U.S., as you probably heard um, through previous events during this conference, um, there are extensive efforts at the um, based on DOE uh, methodologies that PNNL has supported to assess code compliance during construction using a statistical published methodology. Next slide. In existing buildings, um, our working group just uh, in June published a, a, um, a report on building energy codes and other mandatory policies applied to existing buildings that Adam Hinge and Fiona Brocklehurst um, led with support from the Australian government. And the report looked at two main options. One is codes that apply to renovations, um, so regulating the efficiency of the building envelope and other systems when they're modified. Um, and the other is building performance standards, which is looking at the ongoing performance of a building against a, a benchmark uh, and, and a given target to improve that performance over time. Uh, and the report looks at specific examples of both and how they're applied. Um, so if we could go on to the next slide. Um, for existing buildings, just to give a few examples uh, of the kind of variation you see around the world, in some EU countries, they require that uh, when you modify, you do a significant or what they call a major renovation, for example, in Italy, the entire building then has to comply with the existing code, um, not just the portion of the building that's being reconstructed. In the US and Sweden, um, you know, as you likely know, any renovated spaces that um, that need a permit have to meet the code uh, that exists at the time of the reconstruction, the renovation. Um, in other countries, there are minimum thresholds. So in France, for example, in Japan, uh, you have to have a certain amount of floor space, a certain number of square meters, for example, or a certain um, uh, monetary value of the renovation before it triggers a requirement to update um, the that particular amount of space. Um, that can be challenging at times because it may be difficult for government authorities to know when that threshold has, has been triggered. Um, and that I think is one of the reasons potentially why in Europe there's quite a bit of interest in building performance standards, which also link up closely with the entire energy and building energy EPBD, energy performance and buildings directive framework that requires performance certificates for um, all buildings uh, in most cases. Next slide. So just a few other notes on um, building performance standards. The um, 
uh, and I'll highlight a couple of uh, interesting examples. So in the UK, uh, building performance standards of a certain threshold have to be met when a building is released, a new lease is um, signed. In Scotland, they focus on social housing, um, and those buildings have to meet building performance standards where they have a benchmark and a target. Um, uh, Netherlands has requirements for office buildings. Um, France is phasing in requirements for buildings of different sizes that will have to meet building performance standards, not just to document how much energy they are using, um, but also to actually reduce their energy use and improve performance. Tokyo for many years now has had a carbon cap and trade system for large commercial buildings where the buildings over time have to show improvement and the primary source of um, carbon emissions, of course, is energy consumption. And then in the U.S., there are many jurisdictions, New York City, D.C., um, Seattle, and, and, and others that are, have adopted building performance standards. Um, next slide. So I'd also like to mention some of the other areas that our working group has um, looked into, and we would be interested in thoughts from the audience here. We're, we're currently actually working on our work plan for the next two years, um, which uh, the working group and EBC should likely adopt um, later this year. Uh, so some of the topics we've looked at with our webinar series, uh, and, and this is simply a subset, include cross-national comparison of codes, um, building code implementation practices, COVID-19 response, so how buildings um, uh, are operated and uh, COVID and, and how that, what kind of implications that could have for uh, COVID transmission. That was a very popular webinar back in May of last year. Um, we've also looked at um, uh, virtual diagnostics and inspections. So meaning specifically if, you know, during COVID period, we had to uh, operate remotely and virtually. How were code programs able to do that? What examples existed? What can we learn from that going forward that may actually help save time and money? So we also are working on a paper on virtual inspections. And what are some of the key lessons learned um, that we can bring forward uh, post-pandemic as well? Um, net and nearly zero energy buildings was another webinar we had. Um, existing buildings, as we mentioned. Um, balancing costs and benefits of building energy codes. Uh, looking at methodologies for assessing cost effectiveness. And then um, an international review of the trends in energy codes and mandatory performance standards. Uh, we've also, as part of our every year during the EBC um, executive committee meeting in um, November uh, for the last several years, we've had a symposium, like a half-day symposium, where we've covered a range of different topics. Last year, we looked at hot climates, for example. Um, and all of this you can find on the website that David had pointed to. So um, any any webinar, we have um, the recordings up as well as the presentations. And in the few in-person meetings we've been able to have also have the presentations up and as well as all the um, reports. Next slide. So, um, and yep, a few concluding thoughts. Uh, you know, codes have a proven track record of cost effectively saving energy on a large scale. And codes work best, obviously, when complying is the easiest option, which requires strong capacity, tools, and clear enforcement mechanisms. Um, international collaboration on R&D, we think, can play a very important role in speeding development and adoption of best practices, as we can learn from some of the innovative practices across countries to um, create, to you know, stimulate our, our creative thinking and, and understand uh, how we can all collectively work to do a better job in the code space. Uh, and then finally, just a couple of resources um, and references, in particular, um, uh, pa the paper that Adam Hinge um, prepared, as well as another one that we did on cross-national comparison of codes last year. So with that, I would like to close and hand it back to Jack. Thank you. Great, thanks, Meredith. Um, we've got a lot of questions coming in, but I'm gonna uh, take the prerogative as the moderator to ask one that um, 
is maybe a little bit devil's advocate-y, um, but uh, Meredith, you or, or David are welcome to respond. Um, you know, countries are so different. They have different political systems, different construction techniques, um, you know, trying to get different things out of buildings, um, different climates, uh, the, the list goes on. Um, are we actually able to learn um, from comparing building codes across countries? Um, and, uh, you know, what, what's your experience been on this? Well, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah, go ahead, David. I was just going to say I would love I'm to just going to respond with a quip. This is, my, this is my style. There's that expression that a smart person learns from their mistakes and a wise person learns from the mistakes of others. So that, that's, that's part of the answer. And I, I don't mean to, you know, I'm, I'm being key track, so I don't mean to just start with the negative construct. But the answer is absolutely yes. I don't think this stuff is, is uh, uh, transportable. Uh, in fact, I, I used to work um, in Australia as a state official for the state of New South Wales. The big part of my job was taking policy ideas from other parts of the world, but then figuring out how to transplant it into New South Wales, Australia. So, yeah, it's a judgment call, but uh, uh, I think it's both doable, uh, makes sense, it will be easier in the future for all sorts of reasons, uh, but you can't do it. Uh, you, you can't do it casually for the reasons you said. Yeah, and I, and I would just add um, to that, I think the context in which a code operates is really important. And so having people collaborate can help us in understanding that um, so that we understand that, for example, um, if there's a particular way in Canada that they're able to um, implement a code in a given jurisdiction, it may be because of some particular um, thing that they are already have in place and knowing that we have to evaluate, okay, is that going to work? Can we replicate that in some way so that we act, we are able to achieve those kind of outcomes? Um, Great, thanks. And Jackie, yeah, I think you said yourself, one of the dynamics we have within our Building Energy Awards Working Group is that uh, several of the countries with warm weather, Singapore, Turkey, Brazil, the U.S. is a mix, obviously, yeah. right, have a certain dynamic because the codes were typically developed in Northern Europe and, and again, to, so yeah, it's a, it's a shade of gray thing. Right, right. no, that's so true. Um, this is the question about uh, embodied energy and embodied carbon. So given the importance of integrating uh, the regulation of building and home uh, embodied energy and carbon and greenhouse gas emissions into our code. Uh, could you comment on current U.S. efforts to do so, as well as successful model policies from other nations? Um, I don't know, David, if you want to take the U.S. portion and, and Meredith, maybe the international comparisons. Yeah, thanks a lot, Zach. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. It's an issue that we're looking at in our office, the Building Technologies Office. But um, I'm sorry, I'm just not current. Um, if jurisdictions have already built that into the code, I know some are looking at it. And uh, so I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer there. And maybe somebody else can uh, help on that. And of course, one of the issues, one of the bigger issues with embodied carbon, uh, and I think they're very code relevant, is it's not just the materials, not just the recipe for the concrete, it's actually this, that, but it's the building techniques, right? The design and to de you know get the same performance out of buildings while dematerializing them, which is a key part of the embodied carbon. So anyhow, sorry, I'm giving a theoretical and not a practical response. Uh, yeah, and just uh, if I can build on that for two seconds, um, you know, it it may not be within code at this point, but there are code like uh, voluntary policies like LEED or um, you know other other things along those lines that do include embodied carbon. So I think those are similar to how um, you were just saying that other countries can provide us kind of you know a guidepost for where we might want to go. I think those types of voluntary policies can um, shed light how we might. Uh, transition building energy codes to be kind of more inclusive around Im these embodied issues. Yeah, and I, and I would um, add, I think it's a, in many ways it's a similar situation um, around the globe, although the extent to which people have focused on embodied energy in typically voluntary um, standards like LEED or um, like BREAM um, in the UK or um, uh, th there's a similar type of an approach in China um, and passive house in Germany, which is widely used. 
Uh, there's EDGE, which is a program that the International Finance Corporation has developed that focuses to a large extent on energy, but not only, and that they are working with many countries around the world on. So there, there, there are examples, in the most, for the most part, they are voluntary with um, lots of incentives to try to promote uh, compliance. There are a few examples that I've seen um, in uh, India, in I believe Saudi Arabia, where certain parts of cities or certain cities are actually saying, hey, you actually have to um, meet the, the green building standard that we have adopted. Thanks. Um, the next few questions are around uh, affordability. So um, you mentioned housing affordability. Uh, has uh, DOE or the Building Energy Codes Working Group conducted any analysis um, or cost-benefit analyses as to the true cost of energy code? Uh, I don't know. Is the word true there a, a, a loaded uh, a loaded term, Jack? Um, we do that kind of analysis all the time, working with Pacific Northwest National Lab. We can't, you know, it's part of our code determinations. We uh, we will, you know, we release that in our methodology. So we do that, and we think it's the true cost. Any analysis, of course, uh, and it's very thorough. We do it by um, not just at the national level, but at, at um, a state level. And we're capable of doing it sometimes, depending on the data uh, below that level. So yeah, we absolutely focus on both the analysis and the importance of it. Of course, uh, one is making assumptions about the future, you know, price of energy, the future value of uh, avoided CO2 emissions, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because codes last a long time. So to do that, you have to make assumptions about the future. But uh, I. I think it's a very rigorous, very, very true analysis, and uh, uh, it, it shows up positive. Not every code measure is positive in every situation, of course not. But the right, the right combination of codes is, is not, you know, is typically, uh, you know, cost effective, especially if one considers everything, right? Environmental cost, resilience benefits, you know, the whole, the whole slate, not just a, uh, you know, not just the fuel cost, fuel savings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll I'll add um, it, one. We I mentioned the webinar we had last June on methodologies to assess cost effectiveness. Um, you know, so mo all countries are looking at this, and I, I would note though I have yet to see a country um, that has the um, the payback period that they are using for the or the analysis period that they're using to determine cost effectiveness longer than the typical building lifespan. Um, so typically you're looking at a at a lifespan that is five, seven, ten years, and the building typically is going to last 30, 50 or more years, which tells you there's probably a lot more there that could be cost effective. Um, so uh, that that doesn't definitively say every single measure is cost effective, but um, you know, I think globally there are there's a lot of interest in trying to think through this more holistically. And of course, I will note in terms of affordability, it's really difficult for a family that is considering, you know, moving into a new apartment or a home to have control over the that structure and its energy use, both because of the first cost of those new investments and, um, you know, if they're if they're renting the space, they don't have a lot of control. But yet they can save a lot of energy and a lot of money if the building is well designed. And the, and the cost of doing it when the building is designed and when it's built is typically very low. Um, the the additional cost, I mean, some studies have shown it's quite it's quite low. Final thing I'll add on this is that you know in some emerging economies, initially building energy efficiency measures can be expensive because they don't have supply chains yet. And that's where it's really important to think through how you get started, build up. Um, policies, maybe with government buildings to get started, start those supply chains going, costs will drop. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think there, there, there's a lot of evidence that codes um, not just save energy, but save people a lot of money. Meredith, that's a fantastic point about supply chains. I mean, it may not be uh, cost effective on its face today, um, you know, being able to quantify what we can, um, it, particularly in developing countries, but as those supply chains get built out and we have that learning by doing, um, 
I, I think you're right that you could see some some serious costs come down. Um, not an emerging economy, a, a quite advanced economy. Um, this question is about California and affordability. Um, so looking at the admirable energy codes in California, um, all new buildings net zero by 2020. Um, though I, I'm not quite sure that's uh, uh, accurate. Um, is there any time between the additional cost associated with that code, the affordability of housing in the area, and the level of homelessness? So um, kind of pulling together the uh, this you know, cost piece and the housing shortage that um, some uh, localities are facing. I don't know if anybody wants to tackle that. So I'll take an initial stab, and I, I will be the first to admit I have not personally run analyses in California. I have read some of them. Um, I do know that uh, you know when you have high operating costs for a building, that takes money away from a household's ability to pay a mortgage or to pay the lease, which means that housing ultimately becomes less affordable. Like if you're if you're paying hundreds of dollars a month in utility bills. The amount of money that you have left for your for your um, other housing costs is just that much less. So um, I've not seen analysis that indicates that investing in energy efficiency makes it harder to own or um, rent af affordable housing. I've actually seen things that indicate the opposite. But again, I've not personally tried to run numbers in California, so wanted to um, caveat that. Yeah, Meredith, and, I, and I'll just pile on. I don't think the um, binding constraint is the cost of uh, making buildings more energy efficient. It's really a supply problem. Um, so if housing supply were able to increase significantly, um, and some of that comes down to non-building code uh, policy um, that, that jurisdictions have, um, that could uh, really do a lot to alleviate um, uh, these kind of localized issues around housing affordability and uh, uh, homelessness. Obviously not a panacea, but um, one element, I think, of a, a broader package to, to address those um, issues. Um, let me just check the, the chat box one more time to see if any additional ones have come in. Um, what measures are being considered in the U.S.? for the recycling of products used in new energy sources such as solar panels and lithium batteries. Um, I think that is maybe a little outside of our remit, but if, if either of you'd like to tackle it. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it is outside of my expertise. There's uh, a lot going on there, We're recognizing that, especially as uh, EVs have you know, been quickly grown. Uh, USDOE has a very active program in um, helping develop recycling for lithium batteries for EV purposes, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm sure it varies by locale on uh, I don't know those particulars. Great, and then um, one one last one um, before we uh, have some uh, concluding thoughts. Um, it was noted that energy codes uh, not not implemented are not worth much. Currently in the U.S., energy codes are not implemented during the construction and occupancy phases of the building life cycle. Um, is the picture there gloomy? Um, so I think this is pointing towards uh, building codes really only happen um, uh, at the, the first design and construction phase, and then um, when the building is occupied, there's no um, ongoing minimum performance that, that needs to be maintained um, or increased over time as technologies get better. Um, so uh, is that a reason to be pessimistic or... Um, no, it's a reason to get. No, it's a reason to get busy. Look, I think the question is on is on the mark. Um, but there's two things going on, right? One is, are those codes, whatever the codes are that are extant, you know, for that building type in that jurisdiction, are they being complied with? That's. I think that's one set of things that I heard in the question. And if they're not being complied with, then, you know, just a piece of paper. Um, so there's that, and that's a real issue. Enforcement's part of that. Uh, vol education, voluntary compliance, all that stuff, right? Is part of that. But then the other part of the question is um, the ongoingness. And yeah, codes don't focus as much about on that, but increasingly, 
um, uh, there's an attention to uh, uh, approaches for existing buildings. And some of them are completely voluntary, right? Uh, commissioning and retro commissioning and, 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 and data analysis. But increasingly, they're becoming mandatory to building performance standards. And uh, that's part of it. You know that, as you said earlier, Jack, buildings last a, last a long time and building performance standards are to uh, either keep or more likely improve them over time. So that will raise a whole nother set of issues about compliance and, and real life. But um, so that's why I'd say I wouldn't be pessimistic about that. I would be okay. Now we got to now we got to tackle that. But it will be tough. Several jurisdictions in the U.S. have adopted building performance standards. Quite a few more are looking at it going forward. But uh, 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 yeah, it will be a challenge to keep that going, especially considering uh, which I think was implicitly said before, Jack. You know. Some 30 plus percent of Americans uh, of American households are rental households, and uh, well over 40 percent of commercial square footage is rented. And so, yeah, well, right, all these these market uh, barriers that that make the ongoing compliance uh, a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, well, thank you both. This was a fantastic discussion, and I hope um, everyone. Uh, got a lot out of this. I know from the, the Q&A there were more questions than we could answer, um, but uh, thank you for your engagement. Um, I'll turn it over to Richard here to, to um, give us our uh, wrap up. Um, I'll actually uh, turn it back back to uh, uh, David and Meredith uh, for any uh, concluding remarks to uh, wrap things up for today. Do you wanna go first, David, or? Yeah, so I'd like to close on the idea of those supply chains, actually. Um, and the idea that with building energy codes, we can actually grow our economy. So we're saving energy, which is saving money, and that helps with competitiveness. But also, you know, globally, we, in addition to learning from other countries, as we better understand what kinds of um, policies can help us here domestically, if our industry is well aligned to meet those needs, we actually have a pretty big global market that we can also tap. And um, so while there certainly are challenges looking forward, I also see that there's a lot of potential for, um, for uh, countries to collaborate and also country, companies and experts to engage in this space, so yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'll just say codes, um, I think they're gonna evolve pretty quickly in the next period of time. And you know, pretty quickly by code standards, not by smartphone standards, but I think, uh, I think we're looking at a period of change here of, um, of what codes we're looking at, what approaches they're taking, and uh, you know, their importance in the, uh, in the policy mix among uh, different uh, country, states, and local governments. So, uh, I, I definitely think the next several years will, look, you know, will look differently than the last several. And for us at DOE and the national labs and all of you, I, you know, uh, uh, I think that's going to be very relevant. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Uh, and thanks uh, to all the attendees. Let's, uh, I guess, end on the upcoming um, uh, events in this series. Um, so the, the next uh, event is on the 29th, uh, the 23rd, um, uh, and uh, hope to see you there. Yes, uh, uh, last thing I want to say is uh, basically a big thank you uh, to Meredith, David, and Jack for joining us today. Thanks to all of you for tuning in to the US uh, DOE uh, uh, seminar series. Uh, uh, and as Jack said, we've got a great lineup uh, with some uh, additional seminars coming up, and we hope you will uh, join us again. Have a good day, everybody. This has been the National Energy Codes Conference Seminar Series, hosted by the U.S. Department of Energy. Join us for a number of other important topics in building energy codes, just like today's. Participate live in our upcoming events, or listen to past events on demand through our energycodes.gov training portal.
There you'll find other helpful tools and resources from education and training materials to compliance tools like our ResCheck and ComCheck software to the latest on state code updates to analysis of energy code impacts from energy savings to cost effectiveness and more. Check out energycodes.gov for those and a number of other technical assistance resources from DOE, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and others. From the DOE Building Energy Codes program, we hope you learned something new about energy codes and enjoyed today's session. Thanks for being part of the conversation, and we'll see you next time.